one of the points I made earlier was to move beyond primary secondary piping. And, and again, I'm not here to attack it. Um, we have done many systems over the years with primary secondary piping, closely spaced tees. We've talked about it. We've talked about the details. We Actually, last week, we talked quite a bit about uh, important details if you're doing this. But over on the, the left side of the screen here, I'm showing this big blue circle calling it hydraulic separation. And then I'm showing the small yellow circle within it, labeling it primary secondary piping. Primary secondary is one way to achieve a desirable effect that we will call hydraulic separation. And it's very simple. Hydraulic separation is whenever you have two or more simultaneously operating circulators, we don't want those circulators to interfere with each other, especially if they're different size circulators, okay? The ideal condition would be each circulator would create a flow rate completely independent of what other circulators are doing in the system. So if we had a circulator number one and it's operating at 10 gallons a minute, we turn on another circulator, that flow doesn't change at all in circulator number one and, and vice versa. So um, we have in the past, when we've done sessions up at Eden, we've talked about this quite a bit. We've gone into several different piping strategies. But one that I, I just want to stress to you, because I do think this will influence future product design, a low flow resistance heat source is a way to achieve hydraulic separation. You know, it's, it's an interesting story. When we go back to the days of cast iron sectional boilers as the dominant type of heat source for hydronic systems, we could create a header and we could put several circulators on that header. And for the most part, we had very good results. We did not have any significant interaction between those circulators, depending on which ones were on and which ones were off. And then something happened. We started to move away from a sectional cast iron boiler that has very low internal flow resistance just due to how those cast iron sections are designed. And we started to move towards early generation mod con boilers with very compact heat exchangers. And those very compact heat exchangers created a much higher flow resistance. And installers were starting to put these in the same way they'd put a cast iron boiler in, create a header, put maybe five or six zone circulators. And all of a sudden there were problems. Zones weren't heating properly. And it was ultimately traceable back to that high flow resistance heat source, okay? so. If we look at this generically, this, this schematic, yes, that could be a cast iron sectional boiler, but it could also be um, a tank that's heated by a heat pump. And the heat pump might actually be built right into the appliance along with the, the tank. Uh, I'll show you another slide today. I, I showed it to you actually last week as well. There are several products now in the European market that actually combine the hardware of a heat pump be it a, a water to water heat pump or an air to water heat pump, they combine it with a buffer tank, they put all the valving, the controls, they build it all together. And one of the key hydraulic details is that there's very little pumping power required to move water through that heat source. So that becomes the hydraulic separator, that in combination with the low loss headers. So when we talk about the headers, I like to use the term short and fat uh, with regard to good design on headers. Generously size your headers. Keep them as short as practical. We don't want any more pressure drop along the length of the header than necessary. So when we combine short fat headers with any heat source, remember, it doesn't matter what's generating the, the heat. It could be burning a fossil fuel. It could be a compressor. It could be anything. Um, what matters is the hydraulic characteristics of moving flow through that heat source. And anything that manufacturers do to keep that low is going to be beneficial in terms of providing hydraulic separation. Okay. My suggestion to you is when you size headers uh, in, a, in a system like this, we've got five circulators. Assume they're all on simultaneously, which they could be under design load and figure out what that total flow rate is, and then size your header for 
a flow velocity that doesn't go above two feet per second. Now that's that's definitely going to be at least one pipe size larger than what you might be used to, but that is the concept of keeping that head loss to an absolute minimum. If you do that, you don't need closely spaced T's. You don't need a separate component called a hydraulic separator because the heat source is in and the headers in combination are doing it for you. Okay. Uh, again, a buffer tank, whether it's piped up, this is a four pipe arrangement. Last week we talked about two pipe, we talked about three pipe. All three of those piping configurations, four pipe, three pipe, two pipe, they can all provide hydraulic separation. The key is keeping the flow resistance through what we call the common piping. And that's, you see, I have it outlined here with this dashed line. Anything inside of that dashed line is part of what we call common piping. Keep the flow resistance of the common piping as low as possible, and you'll have a high degree of hydraulic separation, okay? 